turn to our panel for some of their ideas, insights, and perspectives, and after that uh, we'll take some questions from you. So I think we'll start with Michael at the end, and the first question, Michael, is uh, tell us a bit about your blog, uh, about its content, and uh, how you got started, and who your audience is. And I, I'll put your blog up here. Okay. Um, well, mine is Virtual High School Meanderings, or at least the one I'm, I maintain the most, probably the only one I maintain at the point this point. I've had seven others that I've maintained at various points. Um, essentially, it's a blog about K-12 distance education, primarily online learning, although when you look at the Canadian context, there's a lot of distance ed that goes on that uh, isn't online in Canada at K-12 right now. Um, I've been trying to do this podcasting with it as well, and that's uh, when I have time, it works well, but I don't have time that often, so I think I've only got four or five up there now, even though it was planned to be a monthly event when I started it last July. Um, so you can see how many months that's actually worked. Um, in terms of the audience, it's mostly practitioners. Um, I There's probably maybe 16 or 17 academics in my area. I know all of them read my blog. A lot of them will comment on things. So pretty much any time I mention an article that they have wrote in, any time somebody comments on that entry, they will respond. Um, so it's a nice way to engage that community. But most of the audience are K-12 online teachers, K-12 online administrators. Um, and because I've got both practitioners and academics there, I pretty much have a little bit of everything in there um, around that topic. So what was the other question? Um, that's good. Okay. <laughs> uh, Carolyn, tell us a little bit about your blog, uh, how you got started, and who your audience is. Okay. Well, Career Science is an evolving project. It's one of two blogs that University Affairs introduced this past year, Margin Notes being the other one. Um, it morphed out of a column I used to write, the Dr. Jobs column, which I entered after writing articles. So over the last several years, we've gone from articles to columns to now blogs. And I think that was more recognition of the rise of 2.0 and the potential um, benefits of having a more collaborative dialogue with your readership. So they're not just a readership, they're actually participating in the content of the resources. And a recognition in this field in particular, I, I write on career related issues in academe, that the experts are as much my readers as I am mm -hmm. and we're scattered through a very large country through many time zones, um, but we have a shared focus and a shared interest and a shared set of experiences and no venue with which to share it, because as some of you probably are, have experienced, academe can be a very isolating kind of existence, and online communities provide an alternative community, an alternative way of interacting that you don't necessarily get in your institution or your program or with your supervisor. You have other modes, other ways in which you can connect with people and talk about issues that are central to you, but perhaps peripheral to the people who are geographically closest to you. So we launched last fall. Um, we're slowly learning and growing. I'm developing my own voice as a blogger and sort of getting a sense of how that's different than other kinds of writing I've done. and. Um, I think we're pretty happy with the way that it's evolving over time. Okay. Here. Dale. Um, my blog is pedagogical in nature, and I have actually about three or four different blogs um, that I use directly connected to the courses that I'm teaching. So I use it to support my face-to-face -face work with the students. And my work is in undergraduate teacher education, but it's also with graduate students um, in curriculum teaching and learning. So. Um, I'm just looking. I have the one I'm using right now currently is a little bit different than that one. The reason I, um, I do it to keep the conversation going with students. I, I don't, I try, it's not really a redundant um, just uh, notes from lecture or anything because the way the course is run, it's about teaching. So there, it's very interactive. The course is interactive. So the blog is there, like Dale suggested, to put links to um, 
something I happen to mention in class and I'll say don't worry about that I'll put that on the blog um, books that they can use or authors I might mention I'll put their links to their pages but I'll also it, it allows for fluidity you know when you're teaching there's all kinds of breaks of, and in Newfoundland we do have winter storms sometimes and there's classes that are missed or so it allows for a fluidity in, in that way of being connected to the students and they know to check the blog if they're sick and life goes on they're going to miss a class but it's not like they can go to the blog and catch up because if they, they miss the class they miss the class but they have an opportunity though to, to get a sense of maybe what what the conversation was about or so it's a supplementation really to the teaching um, how did I get started it was a natural progression for me I, I taught in K to 12 and I've always been interested in how technology, the possibilities that it holds, in a critical way, um, with young children really interested in that. And um, so I've always explored it. I've always um, looked to see how can I let um, their audience be wider than just the teacher. And uh, par probably because when I started doing um, this work in the 90s, my home was far away. I was in a remote area of Alberta. and. Um, I remember I just know my mom always wanted to see pictures and I know all my students had grandparents and they lived elsewhere too. So we always put our work up on the web. And it was hard to be always doing the website, updating how to FTP. You had to have a knowledge of HT, um, H, um, HTML, HTML and, and so blogging just seemed so, so much easier as well. Um, so that was one reason why I jumped to blogging fairly quickly. So it was a natural progression to use it when I moved into university teaching. Um, and it was Rick Mercer's blog that actually got me going. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how uh, sure. advice we have for that. So, uh, sorry, audience for me, um, undergraduate students in education, and then um, as well as teachers. And then that is branched to former, former students and former teachers, former students in my teaching classes will uh, use it as a resource. And Mary's mentioned, you know, kind of the previous generation where it was fair. It was not very user friendly to try and, and use a blog. You know, you had to know some knowledge of HTML code and yeah. FT file transfer po protocol to transfer files up to the internet. I think myself and Mary and Michael are all we're all using Blogger, right? You're I not? use WordPress. WordPress. Okay. Okay. So, so Word WordPress too. Are you, you're using WordPress. Yeah. So WordPress and Blogger. Um, Blogger's a, a product that's owned by Google now. Uh, very user friendly. I, I prefer that. Uh, WordPress is another option. Uh, both of those are free to use, so um, so you can just set up mm -hmm. a, an account. One I always recommend for teachers is EduBlogs, because you've got to be a K-12 educator or a K-12 student to, to get an account there, so you know you're not going to run into anything else. Like Blogger has a little next blog button up in the top, and if you click that say 25 times you'll come across some interesting content because it'll just randomly take you to another blog because um, anyone can get a blogger account and I do literally mean anyone so EduBlogs because it's only K-12 focused um, or if you're in a college event they seem to always let you in as well um, but that's more that's a way of protecting your students a little bit more <laughs>